Hey guys, my name is Shy, and this reading is going to be a little bit different because typically when I do collective readings, I tune into the vortex that everyone who ever watches the video is creating, and there actually is <laughs> a real vortex of everyone's consciousness spread out through all the years that this video will be watched, and you know, you can feel that. Um, you guys can feel it too, it's not just me, we're, we're all in the same vortex and we can feel it and I typically tune into that to receive, you know, a transmission that is directly relevant to all of us in the vortex. But for this reading, I'm actually tuning in more to the entire planet <laughs> and it's not even just the humans on the planet, it, it's like the, the, the planetary... like globe. <laughs> I that 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 probably sounds a little obvious cuz it's like yes the the planet is a globe but that that's the only word that really comes into mind the whole sphere the whole sphere of the whole planet and this is a, going to be a very long-term sink of energy that we're feeling into and I'm doing this essentially because I was shown to do this, not not really any reason beyond that. Um, this is a different type of reading that I've been doing for private clients for a couple of weeks. I asked how can I receive and transmit like specific grounded advice for people so that they can know what are some specific things that they can work on, what are the four what are four keys? That's what I've actually been calling this reading, the four keys reading, because it's like there are four different themes that we can work on over the course of several years to, you know, develop our consciousness, to improve our lives, to do our inner work, all of that. And so I've been doing that with private clients and it's all been about tuning into 2025, actually, the lead up to 2025, because I, I just have this feeling <laughs> that 2025 is going to really be a big year of change. And to be clear, I'm not predicting any specific event. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in 2025. It's not about any specific global event or anything. It's just that to me, it feels like the year 2025 is going to be like graduation day energy for a lot of people and that a lot of us are going to be able to look back on 2025 and go, okay, like that year really changed a lot for me. A big chapter ended and a new chapter began. And if we take the next few years, you know, whenever you're watching this from now and go, okay, I'm like laying foundations from now to 2025. I'm working on things that are going to help me get ready to launch in 2025 or to make a big change in 2025. We have this like like downtime, this kind of slower period of getting ready, getting ready for 2025. So that's kind of why I was shown to do this. And for this reading, it's basically what kind of energies is the planet itself, like the whole planetary globe going to be kind of working on what are the four keys, what are the, what are four main themes that are going to be permeating the background energetic flow of the planet. And for the private readings, I have been doing this all with oracle cards, but for this, I've been shown to do it with tarot cards. So I think that's because, you know, this is going to be pretty abstract and pretty general. I've never tried to tune into the whole planet before, but I guess we're just gonna do it and see what comes through. And I gotta say, uh, I, I almost didn't, I've been putting off filming this for quite a while because I've been feeling off and I don't like filming readings when I feel weird because you guys are obviously very tuned into my energy and I'm transmitting my feelings through this video and you guys can feel that and I don't want to be sending you guys like weird vibes, right? <laughs> so, but I, I'm starting to realize that that in and of itself is very unnecessarily limiting and that if I am in a weird headspace and if I'm feeling off and if I feel like there's some weirdness going on, um, well, first of all, you guys 
are highly likely to be feeling something similar and also that that feeling of weirdness in and of itself is catalytic it's because there's a catalytic energy happening so going forward i'm going to try to not limit myself to only <laughs> doing readings when i'm feeling really really like good and joyful and positive i think i should try to explore doing this when i'm feeling different types of frequencies so and it, it's funny that you know that's how i was feeling before i turned the camera on but as soon as i turn the camera on and start talking and shuffling the cards here i'm starting to feel a lot more on a lot more with it and that feeling of wrongness and weirdness that i was feeling is really fading away so part of that is you guys bringing in your energy and i think part of that is also accepting the catalyst accepting the catalyst right if something is trying to catalyze you and you're just sitting there going, oh, it's weird, oh, it's weird, oh, it's weird. You kind of can get looping in that. But if you really go, okay, what is this trying to get me to do? How can I ride this out? How can I do the thing, right? I think that can help digest that energy. I've been really thinking a lot lately about the phrase energetic energetic metabolism. Energetic metabolism um, is probably something... We are going to be learning more about how we digest energies. I don't, don't have too much else to say about that right now, but um, okay. So I'm going to draw cards for the four, for four keys. I'm just calling them four keys. Um, you can think of them as like four energetic themes. Okay. We already got cards all blasting out here. I'm just going to be silent for a couple of minutes while I get all the cards out. Okay, very interesting to start off with the bottom of the deck. Eight of Swords, Isolation. Okay, so I am recording this in, what is today? What is today? August 22nd, 2021. Um, first day of Virgo season. It's a full moon. <laughs> um, but also in my area of the world, which is Washington State in the U.S., um, all of the like lockdowns and quarantines and everything is kind of ending. And I was actually just out to dinner last night and everything felt completely back to normal. Nobody was wearing masks. It was just, wow. And I had this sense of, <laughs> wow, you know, for so long, we thought things were just going to go on forever like that. But suddenly it felt like, you know, the whole 2020 thing, it was, it was, it felt like it was really ending. Um, I, and I know that, you know, when, when everything kind of goes back to normal and I don't really think anything does ever go back to normal, but it, it's that feeling of, okay, the, the, the energy of 2020 is shifting out finally, right? Finally shifting out. 
And that's going to happen in different places in the world at different times. But definitely for me, where I am, it's shifting out. It's going away. This feeling of isolation is ending, right? This feeling of isolation is ending. And for me, the Eight of Swords is not just like doomed to isolation. It is very specifically freeing yourself from limiting beliefs, freeing yourself from your own self-imposed isolations. So um, one thing that comes to mind is uh, I know for myself, even when the quarantine ended for me several months ago, I still didn't, I wasn't ready to like go back out into the world. I still just sat around in my apartment all summer. I didn't really do much. So it was like I continued to carry on that isolation energy just because I chose it. I was actually choosing isolation energy and I, I just wanted to be in that and it was not negative. I, I just wanted to be in like a massive hermit mode and it was good. It was good for me. Um, but it was funny. A couple of things this morning made me think that I might be starting to shift out of hermit mode a little bit. Um, and yeah, there, there, there it is. That is kind of ending here. So what are we moving into? What are the four keys that we are exploring for the next few years and of course some of you are going to be watching this you know years after i record it so you know please take the whole 2025 thing with a big grain of salt it's just kind of a way of <laughs> bookending this energy for 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 you this this is absolutely timeless it can be anything right don't you don't need to get too linear about it this is just trying to interpret the energetic flow in a way that is convenient for our human minds. So the four energies, the four keys, I'm going to try just by glancing at these to label them, <laughs> to label them in a, in a way that is convenient. So this one first, I think I'm just going to go with the word this particular artist wrote on the queen of that was weird. I don't know why the camera just did that. <laughs> um, on the Queen of Swords, this artist wrote independence. I think that is a pretty good summation of this key. I'm going to go with that. We can also think of like sovereignty and um, authenticity, but it's Queen of Swords, Eight of Wands with movement and temperance. <sighs> Realizing that no matter what chaos is happening around us and even what kind of chaos might be happening within us we can find our independence from it so independence big theme for everybody over here we got the death card we got four of cups which is kind of like that apathetic unhappiness <laughs> and nine of wands with resilience this It's learning about death. It's coming to terms with death. This is learning about death energetics. Very difficult thing. Very difficult thing. So independence, death energetics. Down here, King of Cups, Two of Wands, and the Chariot. Emotional transmutation was the phrase that came to mind. Um learning to use our emotions um, and to not be overwhelmed by our emotions to I have this weird feeling of like almost like crawling up out through our own emotions like a like a snake shedding its skin coming up out of the top of them and being able to exist on a higher emotional plane, <laughs> emotional transmutation. And down here, the magician, the tower, and four of discs, four of pentacles with stability. This reminds me so much of, you know, in March, 2020, I had a lot of people tell me, oh my God, I think I caused this. Like, oh my God, did, did I cause the pandemic? Did I do this? Because so many people were like, you know, for the last few years, I've just been feeling like something has to change. I can't keep going on through life like this. Like the world needs to, like something has to happen. And I definitely had moments like that myself where 
I would go like, I can't just keep running around like this. I can't just like, it, it, you know, every, every four months you have to go to some like family thing and then you have to do this and you have to do that. And it was like, blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't handle it. And I was like, something has to stop. <laughs> like something has to change. Oh my God. And, um, so a lot of people came, came to me and were very alarmed going, did I cause the pandemic? Did I manifest this? And it's like, yes, you did, but don't freak out. It wasn't just you. And it was everyone and it was for our highest good we you know especially star seeds we came here to actually have feelings of change right when we look at the world and go that's not what i want that needs to change and then we imagine a better world um that's literally how we manifest change of course it comes through a tower moment <laughs> right it, it is um difficult to manifest change without any kind of tower moment without something crumbling down of course it can happen and i think we're actually doing a pretty good job of manifesting change through flowing through to better realities but there you know unless we become absolutely phenomenal <laughs> at that with a lot of subtlety and patience um, there is inevitably going to be tower moments as we work through our change. You know, it's the magician here, the tower, and this four of discs. It's like finding, being the stability even through the tower moments. Next time a tower moment comes up in life going, okay, I am the eye of the hurricane. I am the rock of my own reality. I would just exist as this stable foundation and I will radiate stability out to others so that we can navigate through our tower moments with as much stability as we can, right? Without the foundation really needing to be cracked. Um, yeah, so this is reality creation. <laughs> this is everyone starting to understand like everyone not just people who are interested in this right not just the star seeds and light workers and people who are into energy work and blah 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 it's, this is everyone really starting to understand that we create our own reality that we create our own reality the heart one of the hardest things this so this is like this is deep stuff right <laughs> the whole planet developing independence the whole planet striving to understand the energetics of death and what that actually means emotional transmutation and down here reality creation reality creation so i think i kind of jumped the gun a bit and ended up talking through this as that's basically what i have to say about that reality creation and being the stability although there's something about this because the magician these cards are actually pretty similar. The Magician, let me rewind. What I was trying to draw your attention to here is these rings, the four elements, right? Fire, earth, water, and air. The four elements linked together to form stability, being stable when they're all linked together. And the reason I'm drawn to the four elements is because the Magician is widely understood to be somebody who uses all four elements to create their own reality, right? The magician doesn't just, he's not like the king of cups or the king of swords that are kind of into one element, into one dimension. The magician uses all four elements to weave together his magic. So there's also something here about becoming multi-elemental, <laughs> everyone getting in touch with all four of the elements within themselves. Um, this, this really ties into tuning into our multi-dimensionality because I feel like, okay, I'm having so many thoughts at once. How am, how am I gonna, <laughs> how am I, how am I gonna get to all of this? Okay. I feel that many of us have often felt like we need to be pigeonholed into one type of life. Like, you know, we have one career or 
um, you are into one thing. It's like you're either a words person or a math person, or you're either a science person or a sport person, or, you know, you do this for your career and then you come home and you also do the same kind of thing when you get home, right? And we often have felt like we need to be highly specialized like that. And that also plays out in terms of our own personalities. We uh, often, like people who, um, are people who are socially adaptable often feel like they don't have a sense of self because they feel like, okay, there's work me, there's family me, there's friends me, and then who's the real me, right? I know people, I know, I know people who have that kind of crisis. They feel like, you know, they are shaped by their environments and then they don't have a strong sense of self because they always change. Uh, you know, Gemini people might be able to re relate to this because often Geminis are accused of being two-faced or having like no real personality or just always being changeable. It's, but it's like, what if all of those things are the real you? What if, what if you are many things? <laughs> what if you are multiple things? What if, and what if you can really own that? And this goes even, there's, this goes even deeper because the easiest, easiest way for me to get into this is to bring up human design. Some of you might know human design. If you don't know about it, it's really cool. You can get your chart online. It's a, a way of using astrology to talk about your personal energy, basically. It's based on astrology, but when you look up your human design chart, you find out if you're like a generator or a manifester and stuff like that. And more to the point, it talks about different energy centers in your body and about whether those centers are defined or undefined, right? So you have like your head center, your throat center, your sacral center, um, your root center, and those other ones. And the one I want to talk about is your G center. That's what it's called in human design. Your G center is your personality center it's your it's, it's your personality right your individuality your personality and um when you have a defined g center in this human design way of looking at your energy um that means that you have a like a defined personality right that you can kind of go you that you immediately know who you are and that you don't really change depending on your environment and that you're just kind of like yep that's me and you don't really have any identity crises and, and you just you're you're good, right? You're, you're pretty solid in terms of your identity. Your identity is literally defined. People who have open G centers <laughs> literally have an undefined identity and they can be very confused because people will often look at them and go, who are you? What do you want? Um, and that could be very upsetting to them because they go, well, I don't know what I want or, you know, what I want changes every day and what I want changes depending on who I'm around and like what energies I'm digesting because literally when you have an undefined center in human design it, it means that um, you absorb energies because you know nothing is defining that center for you so the people you're around and the geographical energies and the planetary energies all the energies melting around you that will literally define your identity your personality but of course that's changing <laughs> all the time so people really struggle um with that and i got to admit um i've been judgmental of people with open g centers and i you can identify them really easily <laughs> um if you get to if you get familiar with the energy because they don't have a stable sense of what they want and but these people i'm really starting to realize that these people are <laughs> advanced highly advanced and they know a secret to life that i have been missing this is like an epiphany i had yesterday okay um people with these open malleable identities are essentially closer to how like closer to source consciousness right because they can contain and embody many different identities and they don't get attached to them they have like a non-attached way of dealing with identity and they can absorb and feel into and experiment with identity and i was realizing it's like wow it's like they don't they're not stuck with one type of ego right they're not stuck with one type of ego me on, on the other hand you know i have a very defined g, g center i have a very firm sense of identity um and I always know exactly what I want. And I, I used to think that that was a strength. Now I'm starting to see it's like, okay, well, I mean, that's good in its own way, but it's also highly limiting because that's just all ego, right? That's just all ego. And when we transcend our egos and get into higher realms, then um, 
like our, our own higher consciousness contains and includes way more variable energies. They don't just contain just our one little ego energy. And so people with open G centers, like they're already there, right? They're already there. I think that they have a very, they're holding a very important energy for everybody else. So that was a really long rant about that, but I was trying to get to an example saying that This, <laughs> this key is about opening up to more varied aspects of your own identity, becoming more fluid with your own identity, because this is part of raising your frequency. Because our egos are a lower vibrational thing. They are a thing that we developed in lower densities to survive the earth plane. And as we like rise up, our egos are naturally going to loosen up and that I used to really hate that <laughs> um because I felt it made me feel very threatened and I didn't want to lose my individuality and I didn't want to like be absorbed by a collective consciousness now I really understand that even when you re-enter a collective consciousness you don't actually lose your own awareness you, you're still you you're still a distinct awareness but it becomes less about your ego and less about your own identity and less about the things you like and dislike and more about your own individual awareness, your own individual awareness. So, and when our awareness is cleared of our ego, then we can pick and choose, oh, today I'm going to experiment with this aspect of my identity and then the next day I'm going to experiment with this aspect of my identity. And this can play out with somebody having like two or three different jobs that are in completely different fields. Um, people having friends that are completely different types of groups, right? And I know for some of you, this is already normal and you've been like this your whole life. You've already been very eclectic and you've always already been a little bit of everything. But for others of us, this is going to be very strange and we might start to feel like what is going on with me but it's because you we're getting we're learning about being multi-elemental and this is cool because being multi multi-elemental on the earth plane in our own selves and in our own experience of our lives is like preparing us for a truly multi-dimensional experience because if we can't get used to the fact that when we're in our human bodies we are all these different things and we can do all these different things then if we can't do that how are we going to do it when we are truly exploring the the quantum right when we are truly out in the universe and we can travel through dimensions and we can go anywhere in the entire multiverse and we can be anything and we can even we can be living multiple lives at once right when we can really be experiencing our, our multi-dimensional consciousness like we need to have practice on the earth plane with being multi-elemental so that when we really are freed of the linear experience and when we be when we are tuning back into our non-linear experience then we will be like able to really navigate that with less confusion, right? Because we had the experience on the earth plane. That's so, so much of everything I think that is happening to everybody is essentially training us to re-enter our multidimensional nature because when our multidimensional nature really comes back to us and we really get to experience it, um, like as an everyday experience of our reality, some people will just kind of ignore it. It's like some people who, it's like somebody going to a roller coaster park and then not going on any of the roller coasters. Some people will just choose not to explore it. But those of us who have been practicing and who've been more prepared will be like all over the place and doing everything. And that'll be, you know, that'll be pretty cool. So, yes. <laughs> and, This is interesting with how it connects to this key up here, which is independence. But so on the one hand, we are learning to be multi-elemental and multi-dimensional and dropping out of our egos and becoming freer and becoming more, literally becoming more. At the same time, we are also becoming more independent, but our independence is being tempered. Now, that might sound at first blush here that 
when your independence is tempered, that it is becoming less. That is not the case. With the Temperance card, I always, always, always to try and understand it because I think this is a pretty difficult card, the Temperance card. To understand it, I always think about a blacksmith pounding a sword, right, hot metal, and then quenching it in oil. It, the quenching is the tempering, right? So our independence is actually becoming stronger, but cooling off at the same time. So this is kind of the energetic equivalent of shifting out of being a teenager and really becoming an adult. You know, because when you're a teenager, you are really obsessed with asserting your, like exploring your individuality and then asserting it. And you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a teenager about it. Right. And then when you become adult, you become an adult, you're, you're, you are actually more independent, but you are less interested in like proving it all the time. Right. You're just your, your, your independence becomes more internal and it becomes calmer and you just know who you are and you don't need to constantly be like being that antagonistic teenager who is constantly proving their independence and individual individuality all the time. Right. So that's what I think this is about. Um, also the fact that we are becoming more multi-elemental and more stable within all of our elements brings us to a higher level of independence because we become larger. We become more of ourselves and that allows us to have like this higher level of independence. Like if you imagine, say, you, you know, you are trying to become a multi-elemental being who, who contains and uses all the four elements within themselves, right? Fire, water, earth, and air. And of course, everything that those symbolize, right? That's just like the, the shorthand for including literally everything is symbolized by those elements. Say so you want to, but maybe, you know, you're just a water person. <laughs> you know, if you're just a water person, but you want to experience the wholeness of all four elements, well, then you have to get in a group. You have to get in a group and you have to get somebody who's a fire and an earth person and an air person and you all have to work together, right? But, you know, just look at this card. Each one of these rings could be one person working as a group, but if you ascend to this higher level, imagine if you could be up here above the card, this would all be contained within one being, right? Within one being, within this, you know, diamond shape here. So when you get to a higher level, instead of having four people to make up the four elements, you become one person individually containing the four elements. And that allows you to be more of yourself to include more variety inside of yourself, but literally be more independent because now you're not dependent on working with these three other people. You are just so much more as one person, as one being, that it gives you more freedom because you don't, you don't need to be working together. But here's the thing, that doesn't mean that interdependence and cooperation and working together and being a collective that doesn't go away, that also ascends to a higher plane because now everybody is more. Everybody is more of themselves. Everybody is a larger being. Everybody is accessing more of their Akash. Everybody has a way bigger energy field, right? Everybody is just more. We are all becoming more. And then all of those people who are so much more than they were before can all work together. And th that creates like a higher, like a literally higher level network, a higher level network, right? Because it's instead of, instead of being small and networking with a bunch of other small people, now you are bigger <laughs> and higher and you network with all of these other bigger, higher beings, right? So it's just about everything leveling up, everything leveling up and becoming more. And this, I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to mention an impression that my husband and I both received, um, it, like a couple of months ago now, but sometimes, um, it's really cool for me. Now I get to get confirmation on a lot of my downloads because my husband and I re will often receive the same downloads at the same time. Often when we're like standing facing each other and then we'll both kind of blank out for a bit. And then we're like, wait a minute, whose head were we just in? Well, when we come back to ourselves, whose head were we just in? Did you see what I saw? <laughs> and um, it's interesting because you, we can always tell that we were tuning into the same data stream because we received essentially the same 
thing, but since we are very different people and we receive and digest energy differently, we um, get different aspects of the same thing, right? Like I will, I will uh, have this really abstract um, kind of archetypal view of whatever we received and he will literally have seen beings and he see because he's like really uh he's a really really a people person he's an extrovert and a people person and he's like i saw i saw beings i saw people i saw them i saw their faces and they talked to me and they said things and they had personalities and i'll be like okay and like you saw the people and i saw the big picture and so anyway the point to that is that i we have that's how we confirm downloads because Obviously, if you're standing face to face with someone and you kind of blink out of reality for a minute and you come back and you both received the same message, well, that's really exciting, right? So anyway, this thing that we received was that we're literally getting bigger. Like our holograms are getting bigger. Like we feel like, because just imagine, okay, first assume that reality is holographic, right? That, that everything is just made of light and we are literally a hologram. And now imagine that Imagine that you were a hundred times more enormous than you were yesterday, but also imagine that everything around you, the cards, the cloth, the table, everything is equally big. Like everything, everything in your whole reality is getting huger and more enormous every day. How would you know? If everything around you is growing at exactly the same pace, you would never be able to tell because you wouldn't be able to, like, the proportions would all be the same, right? So that's really the feeling that we got and the message that we got. And what we kind of both saw is that our holograms are becoming way more enormous. And that's because that's like the effect of um, of going up in density, right? We're becoming less dense. So just like, you know, a projector, you know, a light, when it first comes out of the projector, the beam of light is very small. But as it goes farther and farther away from the projector, it gets more enormous, right? It gets big, and less dense, like the light also gets more diffuse. So that's like a metaphor, I think, for what's happening. We're getting farther out um, into like lighter, um, more diffuse layers of energetic density. And that also means that we're becoming way more enormous, which means we have more space um, inside of us and more space around us. And that there is, it's just, we just can't tell because the proportions are the same. So why, why was I talking about that? Why was I, why was I talking about that? Um, cause I was talking about how we're becoming more of ourselves, right? And so on some level, we are literally becoming more enormous. I remember that was what we said to each other. We looked at each other and said, we're becoming more enormous. We have no idea how much more enormous we have become. Um, and maybe we'll start to be able to really feel that because if we can really feel our own enormity, that will open up so many doors, right? Because so many things like maybe one day we'll be able to realize that this table is not as dense as we think it is, right? It's not as dense as it was yesterday. It's literally less dense because the hologram is bigger. <laughs> maybe at some point, you know, we will, I mean, well, definitely at some point, I just don't know when, right? Maybe some people, I know some people right now, I know there are people on earth right now who can walk through walls, right? Because they understand, they really have internalized that the wall isn't really there. It is just particles of light. You can just walk right through it. So that potential is there for those of us who are ready and willing to claim it. Okay. <laughs> wow. This is going to be a long video. <laughs> um, <sighs> Over here, death energetics. This is where I have to talk about my cat, Bear. Finally enough months have gone by that I can really talk about that. He was 18 years old and he left his body and uh, like <laughs> did not I did not handle that well at all. But but he in do in leaving his body, he has taught me so much. And it reminds me of a couple of years ago when I drew a tarot card for him for his future. The first time I ever drew a tarot card for Bear's future, it was the Hierophant. And I remember just getting shivers. And I remember thinking when he dies, like I was like this cat, this 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 little old man, grandpa cat, he is like a spiritual master. <laughs> and I was like, he's he is not just a cat. Like he is a special being and he is going to teach me something of high, like, teach me something of deep spiritual significance when he finally dies because I knew he was getting older and I was trying to prepare myself for that, right? And what he taught me among many things, but specifically taught me about death energetics, right? 
When he left his body, first of all, he chose his moment to go. He chose it. Like, he was like, I don't want it to get any older. I don't want it to get any weaker. I'm already blind and deaf. Like, this is my time. He chose it. He chose when he went. And he literally went by running into the light. <laughs> he ran into the light. And it was the best day for him. It was the best. It was freedom and it was liberation. And, you know, we've been receiving messages about him. And it's just like, <laughs> for him, it it's... It was going home. It was going home and it was freedom and it was liberation. And I really had to look, I had to look at myself and go, okay, if I want to take my spiritual journey seriously, I have to look at my like judgments around death. Why do I think death is this horrible thing? Why do I think it is so traumatic? Why when I see and think about death, why do I, you know, have that horrible human reaction to it, right? And uh, I mean, it's so difficult, <laughs> but at some point on everybody's ascension journey, we are going to have to confront our own internal judgments about death. And we, this is, this is not something we can just do for most of us, for most of us, our own life experiences, because of course we all experience death at some point in our lives. And those experiences are, teach us we have the opportunity to learn about the energetics of death if we choose to. If we can, you know, once we get enough through the period of mourning, it can can we start to process that and internalize that? Um, it's funny. I am talking about death, the death card specifically. This time, I am interpreting it to be literal, um, literal death. But it's because literal death is not literal death. Literal death is transformation it is returning to the light it is liberation and release of everything it is leaving your body behind and being free right and i know i know that we are going to be able to shift our judgments our perceptions our understanding of death because it's this nine of wands resilience right a lot of people It's almost like meditating, meditating on death. Because interestingly, this Four of Cups is subtexted with meditation. Meditation. This water overflowing the cups, flowing, flowing, like tears, right? Like tears. But... I think a lot of potential here to... Okay, so something that just popped into my head, if I'm freaking everybody out and you, everyone's now thinking like that you're going to lose someone you love in the next five years, it's not what I mean. What I was just shown is that for a lot of people, this is going to be like watching the news or like just ha having, having deaths come to your attention through things like the news or just reading a book even and, you know, or watching a movie where someone dies and processing it that way. This does not... This does not have to be a personal experience with death. This can be a vicarious experience with death. And in fact, the more sensitive you are, the more empathic you are, that actually means you are more able to have vicarious experiences. So you can actually learn these lessons through things like watching a movie, right? Or through the news. And I, I, I'm not getting, I wanna be very clear, I'm not getting any vibes about like, you know, big death events um, on the planet. It's, it's not that. It's just that uh, somehow, some way things we're all going to be like thinking, <laughs> thinking about death somehow, some way through each of our own very individual experiences. We're going to be led to meditate on death and then find our own resilience through it and shift our perception of the energetics of death. And I have more to say about this. Um, also, what Bear taught me when he left his body is that, yes, he, you know, his soul left. I mean, my husband was asleep. And he woke up and was like, he, he just had a dream of Bear, like, leaping, like, making a leap of faith and running into the light. And it was, like, the most joyous moment of his life. Like, my husband actually saw, saw it happen. Um, but <laughs> also, energetics of death, it's, 
the soul does leave and return to the light, but also <sighs> I got the term soul sharing from Lee Carroll, who channels cry, being named Cryon. Okay, Cryon in one of his channelings mentions that, you know, when we die, there's this thing that happens called soul sharing. And I didn't really know what to make of that because I was like, you mean I'm like got other people's souls mixed in with mine? I didn't I didn't know what to think of that. But Bear taught me, okay, when he left his body um, for about a month afterwards, I felt like I was a lion. <laughs> like I started to like feel like I had a mane and I was starting to feel like I was a cat. It was very strange. And my other cat started doing things that was exactly like what Bear used to do. And it was very weird. It was like, it's like we're all a little bit like Bear now, now that he's gone. And I, and when I finally heard that term soul sharing, I realized that somehow, some way, I don't understand the complete details of it, right? But it's like when someone leaves their body, they leave an imprint on like those around them and those they love. And you, you so they're literally inside of you, right? They're literally inside of you. And all that, all the, all that they were really, um, becomes a part of you and you become more that way. And also, um, there, this is another thing that Cryon talks about. Um, every single time we've died on planet earth, we leave our energetic imprint in the crystalline earth grids of, of the earth. So when we're walking around and you know, sometimes you go somewhere and it just feels like family, right? It's like, wow, did I live here in a past life? Cause it feels so feels so magical here, right? I, like, I feel like there's some kind of connection to this spot. It's like, yeah, like, maybe you died there, right? Or, you know, you definitely did live there. What you're feeling is actually yourself, especially, like, anybody watching this is, like, a very old soul, right? And you've been on Earth and you've died here thousands of times. Your, 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 your soul is literally in the grid of the Earth. And so you could think about it as, like, dirt, right? Like, literal soil, the literal dirt, of the planet what is that right when when you go out in like out into nature to ground into gaia and you walk barefoot in the dirt you're walking on you know death <laughs> like dirt is dead bodies that rotted dirt is dead trees that rotted right literally the soil that everything depends on to survive is only there because things died and rotted right and so there's like the energetic equivalent of that all over the planet of dying and leaving your imprint in the grid. And that includes animals, right? Um, bear, I actually, um, I buried him next to a river, actually in, in like the bank of the river. And I f figured out after the fact that I accidentally, you know, we were very specifically led to the spot and it was in a ley line. I found out after and I was like, oh my God, everything that is like, so, you know, literally everything that was my cat bear is first of all returning to the ocean because he was next to this river so his particles are going to be going out to the ocean spreading around the whole world and energetically his his energy went into a ley line and so now everywhere i go i just think you know bear is here bear is with us bear is everywhere and like all the love that we gave to him right is now everywhere on the whole planet so like the that's only i think this is barely touching the surface of the energetics of death but just you can feel into how profound that is right every single time something dies it it, it returns back to the earth literally in terms of the, the physical body decaying and returning to the soil but also energetically the the energy being released into the grids into the ley lines into the energy everywhere and into the people around you. So like, nothing is ever gone. Nothing is ever gone. And you can also think about, you know, all the times you've, all the lives you've lived on earth and all the times you've died here, you, you were literally building the soil, like the energetic soil. You were literally building the energetic grid of the earth and it's all still there. All of your past lives, everything you ever were is part of the energetic foundation of the planet. Okay, so that really helped me understand. I was like, wow, like <laughs> Earth is just getting started. This is just the very beginning, right? We feel like we've been here for so long and we've died all these times and we've had all these lives. Some of us feel like we want to go home, like we want to leave. But it's like, no, oh my God, this is the very beginning. This is the very beginning. We this That was like chapter one, right? <laughs> this is so, so early on the story of planet Earth. And we have just been laying the foundations, the energetic foundations with all of our lives, all of all of the times we've died, we've laid down the foundations on the planet. So, yeah, <laughs> we're going to be learning more about death energetics. Um, some people, this will just be an emotional experience where people, you know, feel these things, but don't really 
uh, can't really articulate them. Um, but for like people who are actually watching this video, you are going to be some of the leaders in this because you guys are obviously interested in energy work and you're interested in all of these things and you have the the experience, right? You have the experience from having done this in many other lives. You have the experience to understand this and you have the connection to your own higher consciousness to understand this and you'll be learning about death energetics and releasing the, the human level horror of death, right? Releasing the human level horror of death because that doesn't mean that we're going to stop grieving because that is a normal, normal uh, human thing. And um, the final thing I have to say about this is um, another part of death energetics is when I'm just going to use the example that I heard from Cryon again. Okay, this is literally what he said. Um, you know, people who before they before they are born they agree to essentially live their life and then die in a natural disaster or something right um anything whatever it is any kind of event or tragic you know tragic event that happens on earth when many people die at once you know everyone signs up for that people literally agree to do that before they are born and the reason they do that like <laughs> they do that for a very specific purpose because say there's a natural disaster and many people die and it's on the news and then there is a massive outpouring of love and compassion, right? And then a lot of time, literally, it'll mobilize the entire country or the whole planet even to literally, like, send compassion and love to the place and the people who were affected, right? So since Earth has been in such a lower vibrational state, we were not, a we were not able to generate enough compassion on our own, like, without inspiration, right? So we decided to create events for ourselves where the whole planet would be able to feel compassion and when this happens it is like like a, a love of compassion a, like a bomb a bomb of a bomb of love going off right when there's a bunch of stuff on the news about an event literally think of how much compassion is generated on the earth that and that can actually that can shift the timeline right because the more uh, compassion and love we can generate on the planet, the, the, the more we raise our frequency, literally. So, on, like, it's so hard, right? Because you, you don't want to look at a, at, a, at a tragic event and go, oh, yeah, you know, we're so excited this bad thing happened because now we're all being compassionate and shifting out of it. But, of course, that doesn't, that doesn't feel good, right? That feels bad. We don't, we don't like to think of it that way. But I think at least in hindsight, when we look back, on events in the past, we can kind of make sense of things retroactively and go, okay, that, that was a tragedy, but because the earth was so low frequency, then it was like a necessary thing. And people consented to do that, to be of service in that way. And because of their sacrifices, we all generated a level of compassion that changed the world literally. So th the good news is that moving forward, the more we can generate love, unconditional love and compassion without those events, right? Then we don't need to have those events anymore. <laughs> we don't we only had to have those because we were not ge generating enough love and compassion, but of course, every single day more love and more compassion is being generated just because, right? Every single time you you every single time you feel love and compassion, you are making it less necessary for negative events to happen that trigger your love and compassion, right? So, you know, for example, if the news makes just if the news just makes you feel like shit, well, don't watch it, okay? Instead, if you want to stop bad things from happening, literally go sit in a closet and just sit there in meditation and generate love and compassion. That is the best thing you can do to stop tragedies from happening because the more love and compassion we generate, the less we need those unpleasant catalysts, right? We don't need them. We don't need them. We can just, if we all just decided to sit <laughs> for an entire day in meditation and just focus on generating feelings of love and compassion, <laughs> you guys can feel what we could do if we did that, right? That is all we need to do is generate love and compassion. And then we don't need tragedies anymore to force us to generate love and compassion. Okay, and that actually tees us up nicely for the final key down here, which is, what did I call it? Like emotional transmutation? <laughs> King of Cups. 
Two of Wands, the Chariot. <sighs> All of our emotions and passions coming together under our own control. I thought it was so interesting that this deck subtexted the King of Cups with control. I was like, that is so... That's weird, right? I don't think it was the King of, King of Cups is controlling, but then I realized, oh, it's because the King of Cups is never overwhelmed by his emotions. He has exquisite emotions, right? He's the King of Cups. He's the emotional guy, but he is like the Lord of his own emotions. He, uh, you know, in a sense, you can say he has complete control over them, but it's not, I'm controlling my emotions like a robot or I'm repressing my emotions. It's like, no, he is in constant constant awareness of his own emotions. He can instantly and effortlessly drop out of lower frequency emotions and he tunes into only the emotions that he wants, right? He tunes into unconditional love and compassion all the time, <laughs> you know, presumably that that's what he wants, right? He like can tune into those higher frequency emotions. Um, and oddly enough, when I looked at this two of wands, it says down here planning. I was like, it's almost like he can plan what emotions he wants to have or, um, Okay, it's like, say he wants to feel a certain way, he will actually create an event that will help others generate that emotion, will help others generate that emotion. Oh, this is like, um, it's like, okay, so you want more unconditional love to be experienced on the planet and you want it to happen without negative catalyst, right? How can you do that? This, this is, this is, I feel like this is more specifically for light workers first, for the awakened collective first, because how can we help people feel more unconditional love? I guess, period. How do we do that? How can we do that, right? How can we help people hold neutrality? How can we hold people, how can we help people hold higher frequency emotions? How do we do that? Like, so, you know, we can, some of the ways that some people have figured out are like holding group meditations, right? If you get like 50 people in a room and y'all meditate together for an hour, well, you just held a specific frequency for that whole group and that whole group held that for that hour. Yes, <laughs> we created that emotion in that way. You know, musicians do it. Musicians do this. Like, Think about how music has held space, has held emotional space, has held frequency for everyone. It was like in our deepest, darkest days, what did we have? We had music, right? You could turn music on to help you manipulate your own emotions, right? And when you go to a concert, what what is the, what are the musicians on the stage doing? They are creating an like a frequency through their music, and everybody who's listening starts to feel the way the music feels, right? Like I'm I'm a musician, <laughs> um, so I I could like wax poetic about how music is the best thing in the universe all day, but essentially I have always felt. Cause I'm a, I have my, I have my bias about how music is the best thing. <laughs> so um, I admit that, but I have always felt that music is far and away the best way to have a one-to-one -one transmission of emotion. And this is when I was an atheist, I would say this, right? This is what I have, this is what I have known my whole life. Um, and that's why I say in our deepest, darkest moments, we had music, it was there. Um, because even when I believed in nothing, even when I didn't believe in a soul, even when I didn't believe in energy, I, what did I know? I knew that music, what, a, like a, a real talented musician, right? A, mu a musician who doesn't just play their instrument, but a, a musician who puts their emotion perfectly into their music, then plays their music. And then anybody listening to that, whether it's live in a stadium or whether it's home, you know, on your MP3 player, like on your phone, right? <laughs> Where however you're listening to it, you can feel exactly what the musician felt. The music is a one-to-one -one transmission of emotion. And you can, like, that is the best way. If you want someone to mirror your emotions, play music, right? Um, but of course, that is not the only way. That is just the musician's way, right? Um, so everyone, I think, can feel into how do you, how can you transmit the emotions that you want to create in others, right? How, how do you inspire yourself and everyone else to hold those emotions for longer and longer periods of time and more and more frequently, right? Um, you can do it literally with anything. Like, you know, I, I know that like some people who really like to cook, right? Chefs, people who are passionate about cooking because they feel like 
they can create feelings in people through their cooking. And, you know, my husband comes to mind. He creates weird little scenarios. Um, <laughs> like, cause he's such a, he's such an extrovert and he's a people person. And he's always trying to like get people to feel things. And he does that by creating weird scenarios. Like he takes people on adventures and he does things to them. And, and he does all this weird stuff, kind of like a, what's the word? Like a Hayoka empath. He's kind of like that. Um, creating scenarios that get people to feel things, right? Um, you can do it through writing. You can do it through acting. You can do it through just meditating. You can do it through light language. You can do it through literally anything. Um, but first you have to be able to hold the feeling yourself and then you have to figure out how you're going to transmit it. Um, and everybody, everybody can do that. And that's what's going to be happening. And, but this doesn't, I'm just looking at this, the final card here is uh, the chariot, right? White and black horse. I think it's just important to keep in mind that this never includes denying those lower frequency emotions, right? When they come up, they need to be expressed. I think you, you guys already all get that. I don't need to go on a rant about, you know, allowing your shadow to exist and integrating it and, like, uh, you know, expressing your lower frequency emotions. But I think this makes me feel that Those of us who already have some understanding about how to feel our negative emotions, or feel our unpleasant emotions, right? So just feel them and then release them and then move on. At some point, it, it feels like we're going to have opportunities to share that process with people who have never like thought of this before right think of some of the people you might know who are like the least awakened people that you know right who have no who never even engage in introspection who have no interest in inner work who don't have any kind of system and of like you know no kind of spiritual system no kind of even intellectual system no, no kind of personal development system like nothing like they just know nothing about any of this they have just been very deep in the social conditioning of just living completely ordinary like rat race kind of lives right they're gonna have like no idea like, on how to process and release all of the feelings that are becoming coming up and some of these people will have been repressing their feelings for decades and they're not going to know what to do about it. You're going to have people who have been like repressed really hard for decades and then suddenly just having these like emotional breakdowns, right? They're not going to know how to deal with it. And <sighs> it's going to be our opportunity to hold space for them and to just share with them in whatever way makes sense to them, right? You don't need to go into your whole spiritual process, but if you can translate what you do and translate your own feelings on this and your own thoughts on this, if you just translate it into normal everyday language in a way that will work for them, then that will, it'll light them up in a way that will make it easier for them to kind of get an idea of what to do, right? Because they're not going to have any idea what to do. They're not going to have any idea what to do, but you can help them get a bit of an idea, get a bit of an idea. <sighs> Okay, so <laughs> um, this video has been so long. Um, typically, if I were doing this four keys thing for a private client, I would do a, a fifth pile right now uh, to find out what is the multidimensional potential. Like what is the, once all of these four things are kind of integrated and experienced, what is next? Like what is the result of this? What is the next level for you, you know, around 2025, but don't feel like I'm supposed to do that for this collective reading. Presumably because at this point in time, way, way, way too many variables are at play and it would be kind of insane for me to project what's going to be happening with the planetary collective four years from now. So I don't think I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it here. I just, I love you guys. Sending you so much love and light. Bye.